do appreciate everyone and your being here this morning. Be sure to be back this evening, um, 6 o'clock, as we continue to study God's Word. We're looking at the example prayer that's given to us in Matthew, the sixth chapter. So, and studying through that. <laughs> That song that we just sang certainly echoes the idea of the greatness of God. He is certainly the greatest being imaginable. Uh, Romans 11th chapter and verse 33, Paul would write, Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. <clears throat> And thus we know that it is, from a human standpoint, impossible to fully understand God and His nature. But we do know those things that He has revealed about Himself by the Spirit. In fact, in Paul, again, in 1 Corinthians, the second chapter, would state that, but as it is written, I hath not seen, nor ear heard, neither hath entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit, for the Spirit searcheth the deep thing or searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. So the Spirit searches the deep things of God, and then skip down to verse twelve and thirteen, and then he adds now we have received not the spirit of the world, and the we there is not you and me, that's dealing with the apostles there. The apostles did not receive the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God, which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. While man on his own cannot come to knowledge of God, and that's the idea back in verse 9 there, I hath not seen, nor ear heard, nor entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. It's not talking about heaven as many times that passage is referred to. It's dealing with the revelation of God and God's nature. Man on his own cannot come to that knowledge and that understanding. But you have the Spirit there who searches the deep things of God and He reveals them to the apostles who then spoke that what the Spirit had revealed unto them. Not using man's wisdom, but the wisdom that comes from God, comes from the Spirit. Our marvelous being, thus the Spirit reveals to us in relationship to God. But what's your attitude about God? What's my attitude about God? That's what we really want to look at this, man, this morning. Man's attitude toward God, or man's attitudes toward God. And to begin with, let's turn over to Romans, the first chapter, because Paul sets forth several things about man's attitude toward God in, in this chapter. And we want to look at a few of them. But go down to verse 28 of Romans 1. And Paul writes, And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. They did not like to retain God in their knowledge. Here are individuals who basically... <laughs> being described, they went into what is called atheism or agnosticism. Atheism basically states, I've looked at the evidence and I've come to the conclusion that God does not exist. I know that God does not exist. Now very few people really when pressed will take an atheistic position. Uh, the easiest way if in a debate that would defeat the atheistic position, do you know everything? If you don't know everything, then that one thing that you do not know is and might be that God exists. You'd have to know everything to take an atheistic position. So most of them go to an agnostic position. 
Agnosticism says that I've examined the evidence and there's just not enough evidence to determine whether God exists or whether he doesn't. I don't know whether God exists or not. Our society, many people within our world and our society have gone into atheism and agnosticism. They don't want to retain God in their knowledge. They want to cut God out of everything. Years ago when uh, they had the Scopes trial, or Scopes monkey trial as it was referred to. And by the way, the teacher lost that case, but he succeeded in using that case, or they did, in using that case to push evolution into the schools. And once evolution was there, they soon pushed God out of the schools. And they teach now why we evolved from the lower life forms. Evolution is a fact of science. No, it's not. It never has been established as a fact of science. It never will be established as a fact of science. In fact, <coughs> science cannot deal with evolution or with origins. Science, for it to be science, has to be repeatable. Tell me how the origin of this world is repeatable. It's not. Thus, science cannot deal with the origin of the world. But they want to claim that they have. It is a philosophical study, actually. And this philosophical study that has made its way into our school systems now, that pushes God out to say, we, there is no God, we know that there's no God, we evolve from a lower life form, and so God doesn't exist. And that is what is being taught so many within our world today. God doesn't exist, there is no God. But the psalmist will write in Psalm 14 and verse 1, that the fool has said in his heart, no God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none that doeth good. What's the result of this attitude? They did not like to retain God in their knowledge, as using the language of Paul in Romans 1.28. Or the attitude of no God. Psalm 14 and verse 1. They are corrupt. God gave them over to a reprobate mind. Why? Because they didn't want God in their knowledge. So what does come into that mind? It's that which is evil, that which is sinful, that which is corrupt. And so they have done abominable works. Why? Because that's what's come into their mind. Why? Because they pushed God out of their mind. They rejected God. And thus, they did not do good, they did evil within their lives. Now then, isn't that what we see in our society? We've had years and years and years of this evolutionary trash that's been pushed down the throats of these young people as they grow up. And then they reach that age where they leave home, and what happens? They go out and they do all sorts of evil. They live ungodly lives. Why? Because they don't want to retain God in their knowledge. They have come to that atheistic, agnostic position. But then, there's another attitude that Paul speaks of in a couple verses later. Verse 30 of chapter 1. And just to get the idea, go back to verse 28, even though, or as, even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whispers, backbiters, haters of God. He goes on, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents. Notice that statement, though, in the midst of all of these things, here are individuals who are haters of God. 
They simply hate God. That's what it boils down to. If many times an individual who has become atheistic or agnostic in his viewpoints is pressed about the proofs that God exists, then he will many times run to this attitude of being a hater of God. And he will bring up what is referred to as the immorality of God. And many of them will make the statements, well, I'd rather go to hell than serve a God that is in the Bible. As if the God in the Bible was some evil, horrible being. What is it? They hate God. They have taken the things of this world and the, uh, the evils of this world and they've ascribed those evils to God. Those things that need to be placed at the devil's doorstep, they've placed them at God's doorstep. They look at the suffering that we see within this world. And yes, there's no doubt people suffer within this world. And many good individuals suffer a great deal. There's pain and there's anguish that we all go through at times. We have difficulties within this world. There's discord and strife that leads to the wars that we see within our society. And a lot of times those who are haters of God will bring up specifically, look at the crusades back there. Those things were done in the name of religion. That was God doing that. And look at the wars and the evils that took place. And so that here's all of these evil things, and they take those and say, God's responsible for it. Well, first off, we need to realize that not everything done in the name of religion is from God. Just because someone says, I'm doing something from God, or because God wants me to, does not mean that he's doing that action because God wants him to do that action. He might be doing something completely contrary to God in his nature, and yet saying, I'm doing it from God. Well, I should be surprised at that. Paul would tell us that uh, even Satan himself will become an angel of light. then we need to realize when dealing with this subject, and I realize that dealing with pain and suffering and the things of this world, many times we, it's difficult to deal with these things. Sometimes death will be brought up. And the death of an innocent individual, sometimes usually these individuals will bring up the death of a baby. And here is this baby that dies. And they can't understand it and they become a hater of God because they, they end up hating God because of the death of this child. How do we explain that? How do we deal with it? They have dealt with it in the wrong way. They, in making a formalized argument, or a more formalized argument, they would, they would argue that if God is good, and if he is, is omnipotent, then he would not allow this evil that's in the world. He wouldn't have allowed this little baby to die. If he is good and he's all-powerful, he would have the power to prevent that death or that evil from taking place. Therefore, he's either not all-powerful or else he's not good. Now, that's the way in which they're going to argue. And sadly, many people do that whether they go through the actual thought processes that I've just outlaid there or not. That's where they end up because they look at these things and they become a hater of God. When in reality, they need to look at Satan and he's the cause of it. God is the giver of life, for example, not death. Satan brought death into the world. So why ascribe to God that which is, comes from Satan? God doesn't want sin and suffering. He placed man in a beautiful garden. There was no sin. There was no suffering. There was no evil. There was no death. 
and man came along and ruined it by committing sin. Suffering, death, evil, all of these things are a result of, ultimately, the result of, de of sin. And came as a result of sin and thus of Satan. Why then accuse God? God does not want those things. And in reality, many of those evils that are brought up in the discussion such as this, they would disappear if people were following the precepts that God has set for man. The wars, the discord, the strife that is in this world, it would disappear if everyone would follow what God says. Problem is, man doesn't follow what God says, and that's the result of it. And then, yes, there's still going to be suffering because we live in a world that is governed by certain laws. If, for example, uh, there's a cliff here, well, there's a step off here. If I go walking and I continue walking, I'm going to fall off this platform. Why? Shouldn't God hold me up to make sure that I don't hurt myself in a fall such as that? No, we live in a world that has gravity, and the result of the law is that if I walk off into an area that does not have something to hold me up, I'm going to fall. Now, if I fall and hurt myself, and I didn't say anything about Tina over here, uh, <laughs> Now, if I fall and hurt myself, should I blame God because I fell and hurt myself? Well, no. I have simply that which the laws of nature have acted upon that situation that caused my suffering to come about. Death, suffering, those things come about because we live in a world that is like that. Those things happen to people but that causes many individuals to become a hater of God. Go back a few verses in Romans 1 and we start seeing another attitude about God. Go back to verse 22 and verse 23 where Paul says, Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. They have changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man. Much of our world is enmeshed in idolatry today. We recognize here's the Buddhas and the Confucian people. You have some religions, the Hindus, that here's the animals and they are God. You have pantheists who believe everything is God. You have in our society today what we sometimes refer to as the tree huggers who basically want to make nature and natural things God. It's more important, for example, to save the tree over here than it is to save the human. That the tree has become, or nature has become, more important than man and more important than God. And thus we hear the terminology of Mother Earth terminology which comes from that type of an attitude. The glorification of nature and this world. And elevating the things of this world to the status of God. The Roman Catholic Church has all of their idols. Idol one after another. Just one after. They're filled with idolatry within their ranks. Men have, through the years, worshipped the creation, that which has been created by man's hands, instead of the creator of those things, which is God. But there's also another type of idolatry that we see in our society 
a great deal. And it's described in Colossians 3 and verse 5 when Paul says, Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Idolatry. And Paul says it is covetousness is idolatry. Covetousness is that desire, an inordinate desire to have the things of this world and to attain those, the things of this world. Look at our society and how hungry people are for money and things. In fact, some joke around, while they use it as a joke, many of them by their actions prove that they believe it, that the man with the most toys wins. And so they seek after the things of this world. It has become their idol that the money and the power and the prestige that comes with that money and the having of nice things is more important than anything else. That that is the goal within life. They have become covetousness within their life, an idol of covetousness. And while they profess themselves to be wise, they in reality have become fools, worshiping and serving the creature and the created more than the Creator. Go back again one verse in Romans 1 and we have another attitude that's given to us. Verse 21 of Romans 1, Because thou when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imagination, and their foolish heart was darkened. Here's individuals who know God exists. They believe that God is. There's no real question about that. But yet they will not give Him the, their rightful or the rightful place in their hearts and their lives. They don't worship Him as God. This is within the United States. This is really the way that most people are. If you go out and you do a survey and you ask the simple question, do you believe God is, that God exists? By far, the majority of individuals are going to answer in the affirmative. Yes, I believe God exists. Ask the second question, how many of you attend services of the Lord's church? And that number, while a great many of them the, by far the majority of, the, of Americans believe in the existence of God, yet by far the majority of them will never darken the doors of a church building. And that's any church building. Doesn't matter what it has on the sign, doesn't matter if we're talking about the Lord's Church or a denomination. The majority of people, even though they believe that God is, they will not go into a building. Why? Even though they knew God, they know that God exists, they refuse within their lives to glorify Him as God. They refuse to do what God wants them to do. They refuse to worship God, to serve Him. They refuse to live according to His precepts. They don't want that even though they acknowledge God exists. And the condition that we find in Romans the first chapter is the exact same condition that we're finding in our society in the United States of America today. Why? Because while, yes, the majority of people believe there is a God, they do not glorify Him as God. They will not live the way that God wants them to live. 
They want to go out and have their fun. They want to have their idols of covetousness and other aspects of idolatry. And so they refuse to recognize Him as their Creator and, yes, as their Judge. Now then, closely aligned with that is something that we find over in the 50th Psalm in verse 21, and that is that they think God is like man. The psalmist writes these things thou hast thou done, and I kept silent. Thou thoughtest that I was altogether such a one as thyself, but I will reprove thee and set thee in order, set them in order before thine eyes. Thou thoughtest that I was altogether such a one as thyself. You thought that I was like you are, is what God says. If you go back into the 50th Psalm and study that Psalm, you'll see that the context that the psalmist and that God thus is speaking of here is dealing with here's the Israelites and they were doing all of these things which were contrary to the nature of God. They were not living according to God's will and His precepts. They were violating His laws and His commandments. And we come down to this point in verse 21 and God says, you thought that I was like you. You thought that you could do all these things and I wouldn't do anything about it. You thought you could live like the devil and I would still bless you. You thought that you could live contrary to my will and that I would just close my eyes to it and you could just go on living the way that you wanted to. That was the attitude of these Israelites. And isn't that the attitude of so many in our society? Do you believe that there's going to be a judgment? Well, yeah, I believe that. Do you know anyone who's going to hell? Well, no, I, I really don't know of anyone. May, may, wait, 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 wait. Uh, maybe Hitler will. Or Mussolini. Or they might come up with another name or two here and there. They think that they can live like the world and like Satan. To have all sorts of improper thoughts. Improper actions. And that God will simply close his eyes to it and act as if you've done nothing wrong. And that you'll still be given heaven some. And they're wrong about it, even as the Israelites were wrong about it. But another way in which man tries to bring God down to his level is that they think that they can bargain with God and get by with it. I can do whatever I want. I can get by with whatever I want because I think God ought to be pleased with it. That's really the basis of any argument that anyone makes regarding mechanical instruments and music in worship to God. I like it. It sounds good. So we're going to have it. What does God say about it? Well, in reality, they don't care what God says about it. They want it. They're going to have it. And so they expect God to be like man and just shut up about it and say this anyway. And it will not work. It didn't work for the Israelites. It won't work for us either. In Jeremiah, the second chapter, in verse 32, we find another attitude toward God. When Jeremiah, for God, said, asked the question, Can a maid forget her ornaments, or a bride, or a tie? Before I go on, let's just stop there. Can you imagine today? Couple, young couple, they're so in love. And they make the decision that they're going to get married. And they start making all of the plans for the marriage. And then that blessed day approaches. 
And the day is now here, and all of a sudden, the bride says, I forgot to get a dress. <laughs> Can you imagine that happening? That's the illustration that Jeremiah is using here. Would that take place? Can a maid forget her ornaments or a bride or attire? And then he makes the application. Yet my people have forgotten me days without number. You know that there's no way that that bride is going to forget about that bridal dress. And today, literally, people spend thousands of dollars on simply one dress that they're going to wear one time to get married in. And they're pleased to do it. They're not going to forget it. Yet, people forget God. Do we forget God, for example, at 6 o'clock on Sunday nights? Or 7 o'clock on Wednesday nights? Do we forget God when it comes to those Monday evening visitation nights that, our, that I'm in a certain group, but, well, you know, that's visitation, so I don't have to worry about it. Do, I, do we forget God at that time? When it comes to serving God and living according to His precepts, we get out in the world and there's those people and they're so evil and they're wicked. And do we just forget God and go along with the crowd? And do we start engaging in those evil types of lifestyle just to get along with, God, with the crowd and we forget God? That's what a lot of pre people do. That's what a lot of so-called Christians do. They're not living the Christian lifestyle anymore. Why? Because they have forgotten God within their lifestyle. Going back to the 50th Psalm, we read verse 21 just a moment ago. Thou thoughtest that I was altogether such one as thyself. And he says, But I will reprove thee and set thee in order before thine eyes. The very next verse says, Now consider this. Ye that forget God, lest I tear you in pieces, and there be none to deliver. Ye that forget God. But wait a minute, these were the Israelites that he's talking to. They didn't forget God from the standpoint they forgot that he existed. No. They knew God's existence. Yet they tried to forget God within their life because they were living and a lifestyle that was contrary to the nature of God. And so they forgot Him in their lifestyle. They forgot Him in their attitudes, and in their actions, and in their words. And God was saying, I'm going to deal with you. You're not going to escape. One last attitude that we want to address this morning. <clears throat> It's found in Revelation, the 22nd chapter, in verse 3. Where John will write, And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and the Lamb shall be in it, and His servants shall serve Him. There are those faithful children of God who know God's will and who are always ready to serve God. Jesus, when he was tempted to fall down and worship Satan, says to Satan, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. There are those willing soldiers of the cross who are ready and willing and will do anything within their power and within their nature to serve Jehovah God. That is their intent with their life. They don't have that divided allegiance that Jesus talked about in Matthew the 6th chapter and verse 24 when He says that no man can serve two masters for either he will hate the one and love the other or else he will despise the one and, and uh, hold to the, the other. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. What is it? 
there are those individuals, faithful ones, who are dedicated, who are not trying to serve God and mammon, but they're going to serve God and only God within their life. Brethren, that's what we all need to be. That one who is his servant and will serve Jehovah no matter what the cost, no matter what the action, no matter the time, the day, the week, the place, nothing matters other than to serve God and to put Him first within our life. Now then, if you're not a servant of God this morning, then upon your faith in Jesus Christ, repent of your sins. Make the confession that you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And then let us baptize you in water for the forgiveness of your sins. Make the decision to serve God. Don't forget Him. Don't try to leave God out of things. Don't be like that one who refuses to retain God in the knowledge who worships and serves the creature more than the Creator. Don't have all of these other attitudes, but have that attitude of, I want to be the servant of God. If you're a Christian, you made that decision in the past to serve God, but you haven't followed through in your life with that service. Remember in Psalms, the 50th chapter, you thought I was like you are. You forgot me. It's being spoken to those who were Israelites, God's chosen people, yet they had forgotten him. Jeremiah was written to his chosen people. They had forgotten him. If you haven't fulfilled that service to God that you made the decision for years ago maybe to serve Him by becoming a Christian. You need to come back into Him this morning to change your ways and your lifestyle and start serving Jehovah. Putting Him first within your life. Living according to the precepts that He has set forth. then why not come back into Him this morning? Repent of your sins. Let us pray with you for the forgiveness of those sins. And once again, become His servant to serve Jehovah throughout your life. And thus have that hope of eternity with God in heaven where you can serve Him throughout all eternity. If you need to come, do so as we stand and sing this invitation song.